fresh off his caucus win, Trump flew to New York to appear in court in the second E. Jean Carroll defamation case, where his lawyer said she will call the former president up as a witness. Over in Washington state, a challenge to Trump's eligibility to be on the ballot there over questions of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment will likely go before a judge later this week. That means there are now 14th Amendment challenges in more than a dozen states across the country, all of which hinge on a decision by the Supreme Court, which did agree to hear, uh, to hear the case out of Colorado. Oral arguments in that case will start on February the 8th. The Supreme Court, the court also likely to weigh in on the question of presidential immunity, a defense that Trump is trying to use to dismiss the federal election interference case against him. And there's still the classified documents case, the Georgia racketeering case, the New York hush money cases, with the, which the ex-president will contend in the coming months. All of this bears repeating. Because a man likely to be a major political party's candidate for president is one facing multiple indictments who has said he wants to weaponize the justice system and who could be criminally convicted before the first ballots are even cast. That's where we start this hour with the former top prosecutor at the Department of Justice, Andrew Weissman. He's back with us. Plus, the former congressman from Florida, David Jolly, with me at the table, is the host of Fast Politics podcast and a special correspondent for Vanity Fair, Molly Jong Fast. And joining us from outside the courthouse, where court has ended for the day in the E. Jean Carroll trial, is MSNBC legal analyst Lisa Rubin. We're going to start with you, Lisa. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the first day of this part of this trial. Uh, it was already a, a pretty active of day uh, starting this morning with jury selection. What has happened? So, Ali, after the lunch break, which came fairly late, both parties delivered their opening statements. And if you listen to both of them, you would have thought we were talking about two entirely different cases, two entirely different universes. When you listen to E. Jean Carroll's lawyer, according to them, Donald Trump has all but destroyed her life. And that started in June of 2019 when he first called her a liar, denied that he had sexually assaulted her, and said that she was essentially a political operative or had other ulterior motives for accusing him of sexual assault, a fact that's no longer in dispute thanks to the jury verdict last May. And one of the things that kept being hammered over and over again by Sean Crowley, the lawyer for E. Jean Carroll, who delivered that statement is that she wanted the jury to consider when they are thinking about punitive damages, how much will it take to make it stop? Because as recently as this morning, Ms. Crowley noted, Donald Trump had defamed her client again, no less than 22 times just today. But then Alina Hoppe got up for former President Trump. And in her version of events, E. Jean Carroll is a woman who is fame hungry, who has always wanted nothing more to be famous. And what her client did was unleash nothing but a few mean tweets. And should Donald Trump really be accountable for all of the mean tweets that E. Jean Carroll has endured? I should point out, Ali, to you and our viewers, some of those mean tweets go far beyond mean to threatening her life, suggesting she should commit suicide, and even threatening her with further rape. So you saw two very pol wholly different accounts of what happened here. But the thing that keeps sticking in my mind most of all is when Judge Lou Kaplan was instructing the jury about what facts were already given he said, Mr. Trump sexually assaulted E. Jean Carroll by forcibly inserting his fingers into her vagina, a statement I never thought would be said about the winner of either party's Iowa caucuses, Ali. Yeah, that uh, puts it in a stark relief for us. Uh, Molly, you are, you know E. Jean Carroll. You're mm -hmm. friends with her. Yeah. Um, 2023, we, we generally, I think, should have learned as a society that we don't accuse uh, women who claim to be sexually assaulted uh, of being fame hungry. Mm -hmm. um, Donald Trump knows this very well. But you know E. Jean Carroll. She's, th this is not who she is. No, she's an 80-year-old woman. I mean, I don't think she wants to be the... I mean, we all know what it's like when Trump comes after you. It's horrendous. And, you know, I don't think that at 80, she wants to be getting death threats, to be having this kind of... It's quite scary, and I'm sure she's had to hire... I don't know for a fact, but I assume she's had to hire security. It, I mean, look, all of the Republican parties, all of these Republican senators are afraid to go against Trump. Right? I mean, these people are afraid for a reason because it's quite scary. And this is this woman. She's an older woman. She has, you know, she had a great career. But I don't think being famous for being, you know, being sexually assaulted and then being trashed by the former president yeah, it's is not a, really a thing. 
Yeah. Um, Andrew, uh, we, we played that. It's always controversial to play Donald Trump saying anything, particularly when he lies as much as he does. But it was important to hear that because he said all of the things that he's being uh, that he's facing uh, in, in the legal world, criminally and civilly, were all set up by Joe Biden. Um, we worry because we know Donald Trump says these things. And when he says them enough, people start to believe them. Uh, I'm not asking you to disprove any of that stuff because we don't have to bother with that. But it is intriguing that outside of these courts and on the same days when he has court appearances or days before or days after, he, he puts this stuff out there. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, this his statement, just to be plain here, completely ignores the fact that there have been juries that have found this. Leave aside that judges have found it as well. But here, E. Jean Carroll proved her case to a jury unanimously uh, by a preponderance of the evidence and even at times uh, by clear and convincing evidence. A, a, a criminal jury found beyond a reasonable doubt uh, that the Trump Organization engaged in a multi-year tax scheme and criminally convicted them. That is jurors. Those are civilian people like you and me going to court, doing their job. Um, so this is not a Joe Biden witch hunt. I think one thing that is notable to um, what you heard from, from Molly and from Lisa is that the jury here had to have special protections from Judge Kaplan um, because of the concern about the kind of conduct that Donald Trump unleashes. So the jury that um, was just in panel today is fully anonymous, meaning the judge, the parties, uh, the plaintiff and the defendant do not know the identities. In fact, Judge Kaplan said that the jurors should not even use their real names with each other. Hmm. Um, the jurors are going to be escorted to and from the courthouse um, so these, this is the kind of thing that happens in mob cases. Mm -hmm. That is what the, we are dealing with because of Trump and the kind of violence that he condones. Um, but it is worth noting that jurors do their duty and have done that in both criminal and civil cases. And I suspect they will do so again in this case. David, there was an entrance poll taken last night. The question, and these were uh, Republican uh, caucus goers, the, the question was, if Donald Trump is convicted, is he fit to be president? 64% said yes, 31% said no. Uh, what do you make of that? Uh, I still maintain that Donald Trump ignited a cultural movement and parked it inside the Republican Party. And that now has morphed into a political movement and arguably the only political movement on to the center right that has any momentum. I mean, last night in Iowa, there's only one candidate with momentum, and it is Donald Trump. Sure, Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley are trying to claim momentum or create it, but the reality is there is real cultural and political momentum behind Donald Trump's movement, the MAGA movement. And so then that buoys the former president to feel as though he's invincible. And I think the destination we're all heading to is obvious. Donald Trump is going to be asking for absolution when he's on the ballot in November against Joe Biden. And sadly, under our Democratic Republic, it doesn't even require a majority of voters to grant him that absolution. Mm -hmm. And will that allow him to unwind some of the civil verdicts or even the criminal cases? Probably not, Not certainly not all of them and not uh, with, with pure fidelity. But imagine a sitting Donald Trump who's now uh, liable for $30 million in a civil verdict in the E. Jean Carroll case who says, I'm not going to pay. What do you do now? What are the criminal consequences then of somebody who refuses to pay if they are the sitting president? This is a dangerous moment. We revisit it often on this platform. You do as well, Allie. But I think it's clear where we're headed, which is to kind of this seminal question next November or this November of whether or not Donald Trump can achieve absolution at the ballot box that he's unable to achieve in the courtroom. So I've got a doubleheader for you then, um, Lisa. One is you had stated initially you said a part of the determined here is how much will it take to make it stop, which would be an amazing T-shirt um, because I would contribute to that fund if he would just stop. But the, the second question is there were uh, questions asked by the judge of potential jurors 
about these questions, about whether or not these jurors felt that the election was uh, rigged and whether or not the, the state is seen to be going against uh, Donald Trump uh, on a political basis. And a, a few people answered in the affirmative. So give me your take on both of those things. Let's start with the back end first, Ali. The people who answered in the affirmative are not jurors who ended up on the jury. As Andrew was saying, there have been a bunch of precautions taken to ensure that this jury remains anonymous. So I have a number of notes in a notebook off camera right now that identify these jurors by numbers. I can tell you with certainty the people who stood up and said that they have doubts about the 2020 election and whether or not it was legitimate, neither one of them is seated on this jury. The only other person who raised their hand during that portion was Donald Trump himself. In terms of the beginning, how much will it take to make him stop? That's a question that Sean Crowley posed in the context of punitive damages, and she never suggested a particular number. She said it should be significant. She paused and said, very significant. After all, he is a self-professed billionaire. And just let that hang there. She again repeated that he is a self-proclaimed billionaire toward the end of her opening statement. So I think right now we're not at a point where they have identified for the jury what quantum of punitive damages they do think is enough to make it stop. But they are making reference to Donald Trump's net worth and as a defamation lawyer can tell you, in the context of punitive damages, how much a person is worth, what their resources are, is an absolutely relevant factor in a punitive damages award. It actually came up in Rudy Giuliani's defamation trial, too, where that may have, and I know this is going to sound crazy, actually reduced the quantum of punitive damages there. Maybe it could have been higher than $148 million total if the jurors there didn't believe that ultimately he was going to be broke very soon.